proud to be introducing John Rogers, an investor, philanthropist, and the founder and chairman of Aerial Investments, the nation's largest minority-owned mutual fund company. I'm especially pleased to be making this introduction because John is someone I know personally and have long deeply admired. He's a Chicago guy. And those of you who know me know that Chicago was my home for many years before coming to Yale. Through his distinguished investment career, John has become known for many things, including long-term value approach to investing and his persistent advocacy for diversity in the profession of investment management. John has a deep family connection to black entrepreneurship and the defense of civil rights. His great grandfather, J.B. Stratford, was one of the real estate owners of Tulsa's Black Wall Street. John is a fierce advocate of financial literacy for low-income persons. He established the Ariel Community Academy on the south side of Chicago, where he grew up. This is but one way he serves his beloved hometown of Chicago. At the University of Chicago, John created a professional development program that supports students from underrepresented backgrounds pursuing careers in finance. And he's a strong supporter of the lab schools, a K through 12 program affiliated with the university. He's also a trustee, a trustee of the University of Chicago. John was active in Barack Obama's 2008 presidential campaign and served as co-chair for his inauguration committee. More recently, John joined the Barack Obama Foundation's board of directors. For his myriad contributions, John was awarded the Woodrow Wilson Award, the highest honor from his alma mater, Princeton University. It's presented to the alum whose career embodies a commitment to national service. Here's an aspect of John's bio you probably don't know. Like me, Kerwin, John loves basketball and played as a young man. Unlike the young Kerwin, the young John Rogers was really good. <laughs> he captained the Princeton basketball team, which was the Ivy League champ in the 79-80 season. There is even a story floating around out there that I heard back in Chicago, but which I have not confirmed with video evidence that as a middle-aged man, John beat a fellow named Michael Jeffrey Jordan in a one-on-one -on -one pickup game. Again, I have not confirmed it, but I've heard the story. I am delighted that this multi-talented, interesting and accomplished man also has a Yale connection. His daughter, Victoria, is an alumna of Yale College. Moderating John's conversation with us today will be Will Getman, the Edwin J. Beinecke Professor of Management and Professor of Economics. I now turn the floor to Will and to John. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, can, thank I, can, you I, can I just say uh, something uh, to Dean Charles? I just. Uh, one, thank you for that really warm and kind introduction. And uh, as you know, I have enormous respect for you and your leadership and, and your research. And hardly a day goes by that I don't refer, it, refer to your research and all the work that you've done around the wealth gap and income inequality and the lack of fairness and opportunity in our society. So it's an honor to, to be on this video with you. Um, and the second thing I have to clear up the, the basketball uh, story in that the Michael Jordan one-on-one -on -one happened at his fantasy camp. Ah, oh. it was the ultimate fantasy. And the fortunate thing was, the first seven years of the camp, no one ever beat him when he would challenge campers to a game of one-on-one. -on -one. But it, I was very lucky because the day that I played him, he had already played about twenty campers. He was tired, uh, overconfident, and it was a very short game. The first one to three baskets wins. So if we played to ten, he would have killed me. <laughs> But there are over uh, now over uh, six million or ten, over ten million altogether YouTube uh, visits. Oh, so you, you just uh, just Google John Rogers and Michael Jordan and it pops right up. All right, <laughs> great to see you. John. Great to see you. Bye bye. 
Well, I wish I had done that Googling. That would have been a really uh, uh, a great addition to uh, my uh, prep for, uh, for, for your visit with us. Um, you know, I, I, uh, of course, I want to, to uh, echo all of the things that, uh, that Dean um, Charles um, had to say. And, and I'm really, I'm thrilled that you're willing to come and, and spend some time with us. Um, we're um, particularly uh, excited to kind of invite you to, um, to, to be part for this brief part of the day uh, uh, of our asset management program, our EMBA program in asset management, and, um, and to uh, share your thoughts in this colloquium. Um, we're um, we're going to take about an hour or so, just under an hour. Um, and um, my job is really uh, to get the ball rolling with um, a few questions to you. And this will really be a kind of a fireside uh, chat. Um, and then we're going to um, uh, open it up to some other questions. We, we, we already have some uh, questions that have come in from our um, uh, from our EMBA students, so, um, uh, so so those are some that I will uh, I will post to you as well. Um, and if you're ready, maybe I will just start off with the one that I think there's a lot of interest in, uh, interest in which is um, Yale and well, really uh, all of uh, the U.S. is interested in this question of um, how we move. Uh, forward with um, with with efforts uh, towards diversity, and particularly in finance, which seems to have uh, you know really difficult um, uh, barriers to overcome in terms of uh, uh, of expanding the range of people that have access to professions in this career, and. Um, um, we uh, we have uh, one question from. Um, from Tim Shepard, who you will, uh, I think you'll be seeing later today. Uh, but but Tim is um, curious. In curious, what have you found that works in your efforts to uh, to, to um, broaden the diversity in uh, the field of asset management? Um, you know, what barriers do you see as the most important ones, and and and, and how have you been able to address those? Wow, it's a it's a very big question. I mean, it's a I'll try to hit the highlights there and then, you know, prompt me if I don't quite get it all out. Um, I would think of the first part I would say is that, I mean, there's still a lot of implicit un unconscious bias in our society. And the example I give all the time, I used to be involved with the pres as president of the Chicago Park District. And there were nine museums on parkland here in Chicago. And they were not doing business with minority owned companies at all not in the spirit, they weren't living the values of our city. And so um, I called the museum heads together. I had leverage because they were on our land and we gave them direct subsidies from Chicago taxpayers. It was the Art Institute, the Field Museum, the Aquarium, the Planetarium. And um, they agreed to put together a one day symposium where they would have officers of the museums in Chicago meet with minority entrepreneurs. And um, they came up with an invitation for the event. And the invitation showed a man in a hard hat with a shovel and the tagline was digging up business. So the idea was when these museum heads thought about doing business with minority companies or African-American companies, they thought of us as people shoveling. And as we know, our society has become a professional services, financial services and technology based economy. And that invitation to me epitomized implicit or unconscious bias. It was just crystal clear to me. And so I think that continues to be a big problem. Uh, we have this term out there called supplier diversity. When well-meaning universities or hospitals or museums or corporations think about doing business with minorities, they think about us in the supply chain, not only construction, but catering, janitorial services, the basic commodity parts of the spin. So well-meaning people you know, uh, think about creating economic opportunities for black and brown people they think about it in the kind of things that we did in slavery, you know, build a building, clean the house, cook the food, versus being hedge fund manager, private equity manager, venture capitalist, technology leader, what have you. So I think I start with that to say that this still continues to be a problem and we have to get rid of the term supplier diversity 
and use what the University of Chicago uses, which is business diversity, to show people that the university is interested in doing business with people of color in everything that we do. So I think that I just start with that as a little bit of a backdrop. When I think about financial services in particular, it's a specific challenge because of the way that we came to this country. You know, if you read Nicole Hannah Jones's book, um, art, sorry, a magazine article in the New York Times Magazine, and she talks about the history of how we came to this country and how it economically destroyed us. And we all know the story of slavery and, and Jim Crow and the lynchings that we went through and, you know, all the challenges that African Americans in particular have faced in this country over the last 400 and some odd years. And we didn't have a chance to create wealth. Whenever we got a chance to start to make a, get a little bit ahead, uh, like we did in Tulsa, there ends up being a Tulsa race, race riot that destroys all of our businesses. And we can find time and time again in history that whenever we started to make a little progress, get a little economic opportunity, we went backwards. And that's where Dean Charles's data is so powerful that you guys know being there at Yale, where he shows that we've gotten further and further behind over the last 40 years, which is the opposite of what everyone thinks. So part of my job is that I first and foremost, as I try to make change in, in corporate America and in the nonprofit area is to make sure that people understand how this wealth and opportunity gap has grown larger and larger and larger and the ramifications of historical discrimination and racism are still holding us back. And so we have not had a chance to explore careers in finance because we didn't have a chance to make money in prior generations. And all the ecosystem that comes along with the wealth management, managing endowments, uh, being a stockbroker, financial advisor, all those things and much harder for people of color to get into because we didn't have wealth to manage. And so you don't learn how to be a wealth manager if you haven't had that in your, in your system. So the first and foremost thing that I try to do when I'm in a cor corporate board or a leadership role is one, give people the story of how far behind we are and the fact that things are getting worse. Because people think about the problem as a crisis more generally if they see that this problem is growing and growing and growing. Um, as you know, Dean Charles talks about the fact that African-Americans are worse off today versus white Americans today relative to uh, where we were, where our grandparents were. You know, the wealth divide was closer during our grandparents' generation than our generation today. Um, Ray Bashar, the Federal Reserve of St. Louis has the state of the show between 1992 and 2016. African-Americans saw their wealth decline 10% over a roughly 25 year period, while uh, college educated whites saw their wealth increase 96%. So I start with people showing them that stark data that things were worse off. The second thing I do is I tell people that you, are, you guys at these institutions are always talking about the diversity, the importance of diversity and inclusion, but you're not living those values. And you know they all say they care, but then I always talk to them about how Dr. King often talked about that progressive white Americans deplore prejudice, but accept or ignore economic injustice. And I'll ask people in the boardroom, well, who's your investment banker? Who's your lawyer? Who's your wealth manager? And it's always all white men. And so they can't pretend that they're trying to create and solve the wealth divide if they only spend their money with traditional places. So my job is to show that and to give the examples. I sit in boardroom and say all the financial advisors and all the experts that come in to advise the board are all white. I've never seen someone of color do that. And so you try to make people see starkly how bad the situation currently is in today's society. Uh, then the third thing you come up with then is what are the solutions? One, we have to follow the guidelines that Harold Washington taught us in Chicago when he was mayor and Harold and Maynard Jackson taught us when he was mayor of Atlanta, that if you're in a boardroom, you have to, what we call, keep track of the three Ps. This is what we talk about with our, at our Black Corporate Directors Conference. One is purchasing. Keep track of how all the money is being spent by category, and then you'll be able to see how little of the wealth opportunities are going to African-Americans. And by keeping track of the spending by category, you'll get away from this idea that someone can give one big construction or supply chain contract to make the numbers look good, but in reality, all the economic opportunities where the wealth are created were excluded from. So purchasing, keeping track of that. Secondly, keeping track, of course, measuring the executive ranks on the management committees of the boards you're on. What's happening in the leadership? Uh, 
top 10, 15, 20 officers, how diverse are they? And holding people's compensation accountable to that. And on top of that, when it comes to personnel, if you're gonna use an outside majority consulting firm, law firm, investment bank, what have you, insist that those institutions have minority executives on the relationship with the institution that you happen to be involved in. And then third, finally, if you're on a corporate board, keep track of the philanthropy. See how much of the philanthropic dollars are going to organizations that care about economic justice and social justice, not just maybe the opera or the symphony or the local popular place to give money to. So it was a long, complicated story, but that's sort of my headlines of things that we think need to be done and the crisis that we continue to face because of this wealth divide in our country. Um, I, I have to also share a story um, uh, about how I learned from you um, about putting some of that into practice, which is you and I shared an investment committee for a, a mission uh, as a mission driven organization, a foundation that uh, had social justice as one of its goals. Uh, and yet um, was to some extent um, uh, uh, not aware uh, of the fact that their investment side, uh, the money management side, um, had, the, had the problems you just articulated. And I, what I learned from you was um, that asset owners, uh, representatives of the assets, um, had to speak up about the priorities that they have with respect to diversity. And um, it's not just the speaking up, but the following up. So, uh, you know, if you're gonna see somebody at four meetings a year and tell them how you've managed their money, um, you're gonna find yourself accountable uh, for the other dimensions that are priorities of the organization, including diversity. So, so anyway, I just wanted to thank you for that lesson. Well, one other example, I shouldn't, you know, but uh, a well-known competitor of Yale's that I'm very familiar with, you know, I've challenged them over the years about the lack of diversity when it comes to their endowment, for example. And because I was on the investment committee, they started to keep track of the uh, executives of all the outside money managers they worked with. And they found that at the time, there were 270 individuals who worked for the outside money managers who made over a million dollars a year. 270. One was African American and one was Latino. And of course, this institution cares deeply about diversity, cares deeply about the diversity of their student body and their faculty. But as I've often mentioned, if you're, you get into a great institution and then when you try to build a career, how hard is it to become a managing director or a partner or a leader in these major institutions? That kind of data, one out of 270, shows you how difficult it is to transition. And I think I always argue the universities are not doing their part. If they uh, graduate us, great, give us these great educations, but then don't fight for us to be a part of the economic system in this country. Um, you know, I, I, I raised the, um, the question um, when we were preparing for this about whether you'd be uh, uh, willing to talk a little bit about your your personal connections uh, to, uh, to Tulsa, uh, the Black Wall Street, um, and um, you know the centennial of uh, the riots that uh, destroyed the, uh, the Greenwood District is coming up. And I wanted to see if you had any um, reflections on what that uh, should mean to us and, and does mean to us uh, today. Well, as I touched on this earlier, um... And it was nice that Dean Charles to mention my, my great grandfather owned the Stratford Hotel that was arguably one of the largest African American owned businesses in the country at the time. And uh, he created a lot of wealth along with many, many other entrepreneurs in Tulsa at the time. And you know, there was a situation where uh, a white woman accused a, a young black man of uh, making sexual overtures to her in an elevator, which was, we, most people think was bogus created an enormous amount of drama so that it lit the flames in, in Tulsa and literally the whole place was, of course, we all know, destroyed. Um, and as I said earlier, it just, it seems to happen time and time again that the amount of jealousy that was created when this black community was thriving was extraordinary. And the fact that the, the African-American leaders were starting to 
feel good about themselves. And they were starting to challenge the, the Jim Crow of the era. And people like my great grandfather were outspoken leaders for fairness and inclusion and, and didn't feel the separate but equal was fair. Uh, and so it was just a symbolic of what happened. The same thing happened the People's Gro Grocery in Tennessee, where the great grocery store was the, one of the largest grocery stores in Tennessee, owned by African Americans. It was taking market share away from the white grocery stores. So the next thing they know, they decide they're going to lynch the owner of the grocery store and burn down his grocery to keep the up uppity African Americans from having a chance to be leaders. So it just is a, a reflection of the challenges that we face in our society and in our country. And what I'd say from a personal standpoint, it's just again, an example of why we haven't been able to build, build multi-generational wealth. If you think about it, what that land and hotel would be worth in Tulsa today, if it was still in our family. Um, the good news is that um, my grandfather was a lawyer and used his legal skills to actually save his father's life because when my great-grandfather escaped, escaped Tulsa, got on a train, left town, Tulsa was trying to extradite him back home. And uh, my grandfather used his legal skills to stop that from happening. And that inspired my mom to go to law school. Because uh, she said, what a great profession where you know one family member can save another's life through their legal expertise. And that she ended up becoming the first African-American woman to graduate from the University of Chicago Law School. Uh, where she met my dad, who was a Tuskegee Airman there at the law school. So um, it all worked out in some way in the long run, but it was extraordinarily debilitating and, and destabilizing for our family, and obviously extraordinarily unjust what happened to the folks in Tulsa. Uh, I'm going to follow up on the life story because we do have a question from Justin Wilson, and I'm going to boil it down to simple terms, which is um, really how did you decide and how did you manage to launch Ariel at such a young age? I mean, I, I think you were in your 20s. And uh, of course, you had been working in uh, the finance industry. But what gave you the idea to to uh, launch uh, an investment firm? Uh, you know, there must have been barriers to be able to, to start a mutual fund company. So how did that happen? Well, well thank you. Um, I had a little bit of a couple of things that were you know helpful. My father started buying stocks for me every birthday and every Christmas after I was 12. He felt it was very important to expose me to the stock market at an early age because he realized that, again, in his community, often African Americans at that time had not been exposed to the stock market and he didn't want his son to face that same challenge. So this is actually my 50th year as an investor, um, you know, starting at age 12. And so I think I got you know, a head start. When I got to Princeton, I uh, found a broker right across the street from campus. He showed me where to go to Firestone Library to study stocks and all the, find all the latest hot newsletters on stock picking. Uh, Bert Malkiel, who I know has, has affiliation with, with Yale and a prior dean, was the head of the economics department at Princeton at the time. And I got the chance to know him. And so for someone who loved the markets, I was totally consumed with it at an early age. Um, my teammates on the basketball team still remember me with my Barons and my Forbes and my Fortune and my Black Enterprise magazine for long bus rides to Cornell or, or wherever we were playing that weekend and find me a payphone to dial in trades and uh, make things happen. So when I graduated, Coach Carroll made it clear I had no future in basketball. And uh, he was just crystal clear about that. He um, said I was legally blind and he couldn't teach vision uh, when it came to passing. Um, so I went with my other love, which was the stock market. And I went to work in William, with a firm named William Blair, uh, the managing partner there, Ned Janata, was a Princeton guy. And I became the first African-American professional to work at William Blair, which is a great firm. And the great thing about being at a regional investment bank is I learned about all aspects of the world. I started out as a wealth manager, stockbroker. But I learned about investment banking, learned about uh, investment management, learned more and more about mutual funds. And I realized I was miscast in the uh, uh, advisory role. And I wanted, really wanted to manage money and get paid a fee to do that. But that two and a half years of Blair was very educational for me. It was a really great opportunity. Um, second thing was I, I was creating an investment strategy that was a blend of Blair's focus on small and mid-sized, faster growing companies that were hopefully inefficiently priced. And I tried to blend that with the Warren Buffett, Ben Graham value strategy. 
because I just love. And growing up as an independent only child in, in, in Hyde Park and believed in thinking independently, I think if you're an independent thinker, you're more typically a value investor. So I tried to blend the best of both worlds. There were not many people in 1983 blending value investing with small and mid-sized companies. And so the idea to start the firm was that I had a strategy that I thought was fairly original. Uh, we were using Buffett concepts of high quality companies with these small undervalued securities. And as you guys all know, starting a business, we have a little bit of a differentiated product was something that was really important to me. Uh, the second thing was um, we had these progressive mayors that were all over the country and the idea that maybe there could be an African-American money management firm that could be successful in the country was something that was compelling. And to be the first African-American money manager in the country's history was something that uh, uh, inspired me also. And I have to say the final part of it was here in Chicago, the idea that you can make it as an entrepreneur was pretty clear at the time because you had people like John Johnson who had created Ebony and Jet Magazine and Johnson Publishing. Uh, George Johnson had the first African-American publicly traded company with Johnson Products that made Afrosheen, Ultrasheen. He also created the largest black bank in the country, started Soul Train with Don Cornelius. He was a, a legend. And so I had these role models who had started their companies at an early age and had been successful. And they had been pioneers in their respective fields of hair care and publishing. So all of that had an enormous impact on me at an early age. And so at age 24, I went out and started uh, started Ariel. Um, I, I know that uh, this is a question that comes up a lot, um, but um, Jeremy Suarez, one of our EMBA students, um, I think the question he's really asking is, uh, is value going to come back? Uh, you know, it seems like value goes through these cycles where people lose their faith uh, just at the wrong time. So I wondered if you had any kind of views on that, given your long experience with, uh, with value investing. I'm, um, as, you, as, you, as you can bet, I'm a biased person, but uh, I'm a strong, strong believer that we've had sort of 12 years in, in, in the wilderness here where value investing has, has not worked. And for us that believe deeply in it, believe that when you had a long period where your style is out of favor, it's inevitable that it's going to come back. It always has. And it makes logical sense to me as a contrarian that when people fall in love with markets and overpay for stocks, if you have the discipline to not follow the crowd, you should be rewarded for that. Um, I've had a lot of conversations with your, your fellow um, uh, faculty leader, uh, Toby Moskowitz, who used to be on our board of directors about the fact that uh, you know, at AQR, they've talked about the fact that value hasn't worked, but it's, it's time and the sun is coming. And I should also say another faculty member, Heather Tooks, uh, basically took Toby's uh, seat on our board and it's been a, also a really a tremendous addition to our leadership group at the Aerial Investments Board of Directors. But back to the value strategy, why I think it's gonna come back, I think is right now you look at the value, how undervalued value stocks are relative to growth. It's one of the biggest discrepancies in history. And I think growth stocks are overly anticipating a wonderful, growth future that I think can't be sustained and are undervalued these smaller companies that have maybe not grown as rapidly, but are gonna have their day in the sun as the economy inevitably recovers. Um, the other thing I think is gonna happen that's gonna be very, very helpful has been the fact that interest rates are slowly but surely starting to inch higher. And we believe that higher rates that will be caused by the higher inflation that'll come in the next several years will be a big boon for value investors because the economy recovers um, which is inevitable, uh, value stocks will have faster growth coming off the bottom because they often more cyclical. The growth stocks have benefited by the fact that as you all know there uh, at Yale, when you discount the present value of future cash flows, the interest rate is so incredibly important. Uh, it's a part of that. And so growth stocks that have their earnings coming years and years in the future, low rates help them to be you know, valued uh, more prominently. Just, um, and ultimately, as rates inevitably go higher and you start to discount those cash flows, it's going to have a tremendous uh, impact on what you'd be willing to pay, what kind of P multiple cash to EBITDA, uh, price to EBITDA multiple multiple you'd be willing to pay in that environment. And then finally, anecdotally, I would just say two th quick things. One is that um, you know, I'm on a number of investment committees. All of the uh, committees that I'm on have all agreed now that growth is the only place to invest. You should fire the value managers. 
therefore many of my valued friends have lost assets. Some have gone out of business, which is always a sign you're at the bottom. And then finally, uh, our vice chairman, Charlie Bobrinskoy, created a program where we help get inner city, uh, public, uh, actually Catholic school kids and public school kids invest in investing in the stock market in eighth grade. And we have 60 different classes that are, uh, that are helped by 60 different investment professionals from around the Chicagoland area. And last year, over 90% of the investment classes outperformed the S&P 500. Wow. So all these eighth graders are outperforming all the pros, <laughs> which is a sign that this growth market cannot continue because they all own all the same names. You know, they all own Tesla, they all, all own Apple, et cetera. So that's another sign that markets are frothy and value will come back. Hmm. Well, uh, those students might have a future anyway, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. It's, it's good to get them started early, and, and it's a similar program to what we have with our Aerial Community Academy that's now 25 years old, and we're teaching kids at our small public school about investing with real money. Well, I, I think that's something else that really struck me when we, were, we uh, prepped for this was your interest in financial literacy, and particularly on the... Uh, I, I would say on the end oriented towards uh, equity. And um, you, know, um, you know, if you could share a little bit more of your, um, your thoughts about the role of uh, education and why you've invested so heavily in it uh, as a philanthropist, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, I start by saying I've been heavily influenced by my best friend who uh, I met at the University of Chicago uh, lab school when he was 12 years, like probably when he was like 10 years old actually. And I was uh, 15 or 16 and that's Arnie Duncan. And when Arnie Duncan uh, finished playing basketball in Australia, he came to work at Ariel and headed up our foundation. And his mom had run an after school tutoring program uh, for over 50 years and just inspired Arnie to understand how important education was, especially for urban inner city kids. And in fact, my, 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 my Yale daughter uh, wrote about her volunteer activities at the Sue Duncan Center as a part of her application when she applied to Yale. Um, you know, she's 30 years old, so it's a while ago now. And um, so Arnie came and he helped convince me how important education was. And our first program, we had a program called an I Have a Dream program, where we adopted a sixth grade class and promised to make college affordable for these kids as they grew. And that worked pretty well, but then Arnie and his sister, Sarah, decided that sixth grade was too late. You needed to start with kids in kindergarten. So they came up with the idea of starting a small public school roughly 25 years ago and named it the Aerial Community Academy. And it was kind of a, a part of our philanthropy instead of giving to lots of different places, let's focus on one community with one public school. And uh, so I have to say that it came from their leadership. Of course, my mom and dad believe deeply in education too. And so it was a natural for me to fall for the ideas that, John, that Arnie and Sarah came up with. The other thing I would say was once the school got started, we came up with the idea that we should teach financial literacy to the kids because we felt that we talked about it earlier in our conversation today that African-American kids are underexposed to the stock market, often are not prepared when they get into the work world to uh, be investors and understanding the magic of compound interest and having experience with multi-generational wealth and things that come from that, uh, from having, having wealth. So we created a program where every first grade class at the Aero Community Academy gets a $20,000 class gift and they watch us manage it for the first six years or so. Uh, they come and meet with our analysts. We go down to the school and talk to the kids. We have a full-time education teacher there teaching the kids about the markets. And then in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, they start to pick real stocks with real money. And it's been a program that we think has been really valuable. Um, President Obama was inspired by, by the school, which is just four blocks away from his home uh, in Hyde Park, Kenwood. And uh, so he asked me to chair his task force uh, on, uh, uh, on financial literacy while he was president. So I got a chance to do that for six years and learn about all the different financial literacy concepts throughout the country. And our main recommendation to President Obama was, how can we get financial services companies to partner with urban public schools in the way that we have with Ariel? And to really build in intense partnerships with public schools. So not only do the kids learn about uh, 
the stock market and learn about all the different asset classes and learn about how to save too. But they also see role models and can help inspire them for financial services careers, which we think is part of the question that was also discussed earlier. We think if you get kids exposed to the market earlier, they will see and get to see people like us making a living, uh, picking stocks, doing research and loving it. And they'll want to do the same thing. So uh, that's been something that we've been proud of. Many and many of the young people have worked here, some are interns, some have worked with us full time. One of the graduates is actually being featured in a NASDAQ ad talking about his app, Rapunzel, where it's helping to educate inner kids in general, but especially a focus on urban kids about the stock market. So it's nice to see these kids grow up over these last 25 years and end up in financial services and end up doing philanthropic activities to teach one, uh, uh, teach financial services to young people. It's been really an exciting thing. And but it all comes back to Arnie Duncan's leadership who made all the difference. Mm. Well, this whole idea of making uh, the stock market in some sense part of people's lives early on so that they don't think that it's this um, reprehensible part of society, which uh, we should get rid of soon, um, but really is a way for families to save and, and, uh, and for, for people to get ahead, really. Um, you know, I, I love that message, and, but finding ways to um, convey it uh, without making it sound like rocket science uh, and financial engineering, you know, that's, that's a challenge. Um, I see some questions that are coming from uh, your audience. And uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some picking and choosing uh, and, and uh, let you field them. Um, one of them is about um, infrastructure and particularly, um, I would say, green infrastructure to the extent that water is such an important uh, thing in this world um, that requires infrastructure investment. Uh, Tanush uh, Wadhawan um, says, I'm interested in learning uh, your opinion um, about um, investment in that market and, um, and how, do you, uh, how do you think about sustainable products and, what, and whether or not there's actually, um, it's possible to convince people to invest in them. Let me start, but I also I want to put one of my aerial colleagues on the spot, who I think is on the Zoom, uh, Leah, who is one of our executives helping to oversee our ESG investing, and she is a graduate of the Yale School of Forestry. Who we we talked about when we were preparing for this, uh, but maybe while we're finding her, I would just say to say I you know I'm very lucky to be on the board of Nike, and I'm on the committee that oversees all of their ESG investing, all the things around. Uh, sustainable investing. And they, more and more, uh, the major corporations that I'm involved in, same at McDonald's, are totally committed to this. It's, it's been shocking at how fast it's changed, how important it is to be able to be totally serious about the environment if you're running the major corporation here in America uh, and around the world. I think places like McDonald's and, and Nike understand that their customers care deeply about these issues and that if they wanna be a 21st century company and a hot popular company, they have to think about this in a very serious way. Um, the second thing that I would uh, say about that is that they also understand that if you wanna get young dynamic leaders in your firm, you have to be seen as very forward thinking around these issues or you're not gonna be able to get the best talent to come and join your organization. So these issues are more important than ever, but the details, I wanted to give Leah a chance because she's the real expert and been a great addition to our team in the last, uh, Year or so. Yeah, thanks, John. I uh, appreciate the shout out and just a little bit of background on myself. I pursued a Master of Environmental Management from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, graduating a couple years ago, and I spent about half my time at the School of Management and half of my time at the School of Forestry, so really had the privilege of an interdisciplinary education in that way. Um, so specifically to the question around water investment, I think increasingly we're seeing or we're observing investment in water infrastructure in more in the fixed income space. So whether that be municipal bonds, kind of state level infrastructure, city level infrastructure, you're seeing the incorporation of criteria, green criteria into bonds um, more and more. And the DC in Washington DC, one of the first green bonds ever really executed was 
a water related bond. Um, it was to, it was to fortify their their water infrastructure after they experienced flooding and um, some some ill effects after a natural disaster. So there are great examples of that out there as as small mid cap public equity investors. So we have a little less exposure, obviously, to things like municipal municipal bonds. Um, and then to answer the questions in terms of uh, kind of demand for for ESG and sustainable products, whether if we're talking in the consumer space, certainly many of our companies in our portfolio are expressing to us greater demand for green and sustainable products. We have to do a lot of due diligence as investors to validate whether or not companies are greenwashing. Um, but increasingly our clients are also asking us about how we think about ESG. So there's demand both from consumers that are looking to companies to produce green products, but there's also demand from asset owners and institutional investors that their asset managers like us at Ariel are thinking about ESG and long-term risk related to climate change, diversity, et cetera. Um, so we're just, we've observed a growth in demand in, in many facets. Thank you. Uh, this uh, push by asset owners to, um, to see change and uh, to hold their managers accountable uh, is definitely something that is expanding uh, every single year. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we've seen it, um, we've seen it um, do good things, um, but uh, it's also uh, hard to figure out solutions if you're if you're, um, you know, having to, um, uh, if you're having to do what Leah is talking about, which is do all the due diligence to figure out what the what the companies themselves are doing, um, I'm wondering, John, where you think this is going in terms of uh, just the informational challenges uh, and um, you know reconciling the need kind of the fiduciary need to have the money generate uh, profits. Um, at the same time, address um, you know social um, uh, the fiduciary needs of society, if you will. I know you've thought about that and written about it, but I wanted to get your um, views on it now. I would say uh, the first on that last part of the question is I think that a lot of us are understanding that if you do these things right, it's going to enhance the performance of your portfolio, and it will enhance the form performance of the portfolio companies that you're often guiding and discussing these issues with. Um, it's just so, so important because if you think about it, all the things that are a part of ESG, and you know, and I think about often we talk a lot about diversity and governance and the like, but just think about the damage that's done to corporations that don't do this well. You know, if they end up with regulatory lawsuits and litigation, if they end up being accused of sexual harassment or improper behavior to employees, it can have profound impacts on their market caps. So one of the things we've talked about with our board of directors and our aerial mutual fund board is that the work that we do, that we are convinced will help us have better performance because these companies will have less black hole risks. And as I said earlier, they'll be stronger companies if they're seen by, in, in, by investors, by consumers and by employees as forward thinking types of companies. And they will be able to again attract the best talent, have the best products, and ultimately achieve the best performance for their shareholders. So I don't think you have to have either or. I think if you do this well, you will actually do really well. The other thing that I would say, and I, is that this is moving very, very rapidly. There's just such a fast-growing consensus from all of corporate America, and we've seen some of the things that Jamie Dimon's talked about, and the leadership of various business organizations to becoming uh, more. Uh, accommodating, going against the sort of traditions of the Milton Friedman's of the world and the old school uh, economists and moving into understanding that having a social conscience is important and doing things the right way for society ultimately will build long-term value. And so maybe there are short-term costs, but when you're really thinking about long-term value for your shareholders, there's no doubt in my mind doing these things the right way will add value and ultimately end up with better performance for those companies and the money managers who invest in them. And the final, final thing I would say is that, um, you know, is we've seen how quickly society can shift, shift. We, you know, 10 years ago, politicians didn't believe in gay marriage. Today, it's become acceptable. 
everyone believes in it. Everyone knows it's the right thing for people to be able to uh, marry who they love. It's not even an issue, uh, especially with next generation leaders. Everyone understands that this is a settled perspective. I think this is quickly becoming the same thing in terms of ESG. People understand it's the right thing to do. And the next generation of leaders understand that you won't be able to be a successful business if you're not on top of these uh, very important issues. Uh, we have a question from Peyton Brooks, um, and uh, again, I'm going to paraphrase, but, um, you know, it's about this um, kind of yin and yang of public capital markets and private equity, and uh, the, the question of whether or not value is being created in private equity that we're not able to um, access if we're only investing in public securities. And then, you know, in, in, uh, in, from the perspective of Ariel, what do you do about that? I mean, uh, you know, some mutual fund companies um, uh, have uh, sort of created pipelines of buying uh, into um, uh, companies before they go uh, uh, public. And, uh, but um, do you see that as a, as a long-term uh, problem for investors if, and also for, for firms that are, like mutual fund firms that are mainly focused only on the public capital markets. I would think I would continue to believe that it's going to be blur a blurred phenomenon. I think that um, with technology the way it is, and with some of the loosening of the reins by the SEC and various regulatory bodies, I think the idea that public money managers and mutual funds can invest in privately held companies, I think that's which is going to continue to grow because there's so much more transfer, tra you know, there's so much more uh, ability to see the information. More and more of these private companies are, are governed as, as if they are public companies. Often they've been funded by major firms like KKR or Blackstone or whatever it happens to be. And so the, the, this, this distinction between public and private, I think, is going to continue to, get, continue to blur. Um, so I think that's about, you know, we don't actually have not really done that at Ariel, but I think down the road, it's something we'll be forced to look at because our competitors are doing it, especially the large fund complexes, as you know, the Fidelity's, the Tebow prices, um, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you wonder whether they're, they're, they're ever able to achieve the transparency. And of course the transparency is ex post, not ex ante when you invest, uh, even if there is some, in other words, uh, this notion of creating a fund and saying, trust me, I'm going to buy good stuff uh, is a lot different than a mutual fund saying, look, you can see what we, we own and, 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 uh, and, and trust that we're, we're for example, um, taking uh, account of ESG because you can see for yourself. Well, one of the interesting things, I mean, it's not directly to your question, but when you mention ESG, it sort of ties it into something I've been thinking a lot about and some of my friends have been thinking about. When it comes to diversity and inclusion, the private companies are much, much worse off than the public companies. And if you think about it, you know, the public numbers are not very good, but most of the Fortune 500 companies have diverse boards and some diverse leadership. The private companies that have been funded by these major private equity and venture capital firms are amazingly non-diverse. Uh, and when it comes to their board of directors, it's typically less than 1% of their board members of privately held companies that are getting prepared to go public have African-Americans on the boards, for example. And it's fascinating because a lot of us have been fortunate to be asked to be on you know, Fortune 100 boards. Publicly traded companies have never been asked to be on the board of a privately held company that's about to go public. And it's just, it just shows you that without public pressure, uh, people are left to their own devices. They will continue to populate their leadership roles with people that look like them. And uh, it's especially troubling because you know, the wealth creation that comes from being on the board of a privately held company dwarfs the wealth that's created when you're on a publicly held company. And the final thing I would say is if our leaders acted differently, just think of it, if the David Swinsons of the world and the leadership at Princeton and the Rockefeller Foundation and the Gates Foundation and the public pension funds of New York State or New York City all told their private equity firms and their venture capital firms that not only did they have to have leadership that looked like America, but their board seats needed to look like America, it would change overnight. 
and the opportunities that I talked about earlier that should be there for minority students when they graduate from these great institutions, there'd be great demand for that talent. But we somehow just sit idly by and let you know, these firms that are, you know, look like 1940s companies before Jackie Robinson started playing baseball to come in, get the big checks from these pension funds and endowments and have no responsibility or accountability to do the right thing. You know, I think that's something that's slowly but surely starting to change. There's some political pressure being put. Uh, Congressman Cleaver and uh, uh, Congressman Kennedy helped to make a change there and Others, Reverend Sharpton has been uh, sending out letters to university endowments asking them about these issues. And similarly, uh, some Congress, congressional leaders have really get engaged and involved, involved at, at the House Financial Services Committee, people like Maxine Waters and Congressman Joyce Beatty. So it's starting to happen slowly but surely. But again, my bottom line when it comes to privately held companies, they look nothing like America, look more like a 1930s America than a 21st century. Um, Khalil Morse also has um, an, a, a question that really relates to a little bit of this public and private. You know, uh, when you have private equity, the money goes in, but you don't get it back for a long time. And there are good things about that, which is, you know, um, uh, the money's not going to be hot. Uh, you know, you, you've made a commitment over the, over the next five years uh, and you're, you're, you know you're going to have to wait to start getting some cash back. Um, but on the other hand, for a mutual fund company, uh, you've got a flow that's happening all the time, you know, kind of hot money that, that, uh, that uh, you know, can cause you headaches because of liquidity issues and trying to predict uh, what's happening. And, and uh, you know, you, you've got a morning star stars that are happening all the time, you know, so, I mean, is that just, um, you know, how do you deal with that? And, um, and uh, you know, is that going to longer term create problems for mutual, the mutual fund sector, if, if this sort of private equity thing really becomes more broadly accessible? Well, I, I think, well, it is a challenge. There's more competition than ever than when our aerial fund now started. It started in 1986, so it's 30, it'll be 35 years old this year. Um, we have much, much more competitive pressures, you know, not only from other fund complexes, but as the question suggests from the private equity world, as more and more people are decide to index with uh, the public company money and then put the rest in private. And that makes it hard uh, for us. Um, I would also say that what I think might mitigate it is everyone wants to be in private equity now. Everyone's look, everyone likes to look backwards, you know, drive by looking at the rear view mirror and, and everyone sees all their friends that are worth hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, you know, 10 years out of business school, working for a hot private equity firm. And so of course, when everyone sees that, everyone decides that's what they want to do, that's what they want to be. And so you're starting, you're seeing private equity startups everywhere. You know, everyone wants to be the, uh, you know, the next Henry Kravitz. And, and so I think that when everyone's trying to do it, it's going to bid up the prices, of course, of private equity companies. You're not gonna be able to get the same returns that you're the next 20 years as you've gotten the last 20 years. And so maybe the competitive threat won't be so dramatic, even though they might have some benefits based upon the longevity of the assets. But the other thing they have the downside of huge fees. You know, the two and 20 structure is still alive and well. I know it's getting challenged a little bit, maybe you get one and a half and 15 or what have you. So that's a huge headwind to overcome. And Warren Buffett talks a lot about that. And I think we're gonna look 10 years from now and realize that um, maybe the big guys will be able to survive and do it, but it's gonna be really hard for smaller up and coming firms to come in and compete. And maybe if people come back to the old fashioned uh, mutual funds that instead of getting two and 20, we get 60 basis points. And um, there'll be less, you know, of all the smart people have left to go to private equity, maybe it gives us some opportunities to find some inefficiently priced companies from doing our traditional investing in mutual funds. So I get it, it's a, it's a tough competitor out there, but it's, it's not all one-sided looking forward. Um, I've got a question from uh, um, Benga uh, Omosuyi, uh, who's also actually, he's the TA for the class. Um, and uh, so, um, 
Yes, what are your views on the decentralization of finance, uh, um, particularly as it relates to uh, how technology is disrupting and increasing transparency in the industry and uh, consumer access to financial investment products? Is this seen as a threat uh, to the mutual fund and brokerage industries or, uh, or something else? Well, I think, I'm not sure, you know, there's so much going on in the technology world, obviously the Robin Hoods and ways that individuals can now invest and trade quickly and easily and efficiently and bring everybody into the game. Um, it's helping maybe to uh, make this market more bubble-like than ever. So ultimately, I think all this uh, transparency and technology will ultimately lead to some kind of a crisis and crash the same way the internet bubble burst 20 years ago. Uh, I think you're going to see that kind of bubble bursting in the future that will have been egged on by all the individuals getting into the world. Um, the place where technology makes a difference if, you have difference, if you have the capital to build the great systems and be able to trade quickly and take advantage of slight price uh, inefficiencies on a daily basis, minute by minute, you know, um, that is a real way to outperform, but it takes enormous amount of resources to be able to have that kind of world-class technology to take, a, take, take advantage of that and have millisecond advantages over somebody else who's trying to out-trade you. I think those things do work. Um, but outside of that, the, the basic stock business, stock picking business is always gonna be one about being able to see the future better than your peers. There's very few people can do it. Markets are extraordinarily efficient. I often tell people it's like trying to pick who's gonna have number one songs in, in music. You know, for every Stevie Wonder or John Lennon, there's thousands and thousands of people out there that try to make music, hope to be superstars. Maybe they have one hit song once and never replicate it again. Many of them never ever have a song that's in the top 40 or whatever they call it today. So I think picking stocks is very much like that. There's a handful of people who have great vision and great ability, and they'll always be able to outperform. And everybody else is going to have their ups and their downs, their good days, their bad days, their good years and bad years, and they'll all round out to being average minus the fees. Um, we've got um, we've actually got a, a, a range of questions that ex that uh, extend from how do I find out more about your your class gift program to what do you think of the gamification uh, dimension, which which you've kind of answered a bit. Um, when it comes to Robin Hood. Um, maybe I will give uh, Kat Sabatini um, uh, the last question here. She wants to know if you have any um, advice for investors uh, uh, in the new um, presidential administration. I mean, um, is, there a, is there a sea change for investors that you think um, uh, they should be thinking about? Well, I, I mentioned this earlier. I mean, um, first I should say the caveat is we are long, long-term investors. You know, our logo at Ariel is a turtle. Um, we often own stocks for 10, 15, 20 years and really don't make decisions based upon short-term uh, predictions of the economy or what's happening in Washington and around. But I have to say this is a unique period that we've gone through with the pandemic and the huge amount of stimulus that's come in and it's gonna to continue to come in and be more than expected because as we know, Biden, President Biden would like to have a, a major new stimulus uh, uh, enacted very soon. And ultimately that'll be a spark we think to really get the uh, inflation moving up faster than anyone ever could have anticipated. And we think that that again will cause higher interest rates which will impact uh, the growth stocks pretty dramatically. So. We think that this new environment will, that, that from this new administration will be very difficult for, uh, for hot, fast, high PE growth stocks. Secondly, we think the regulatory environment is going to change dramatically. So we think that you've got to understand which of your companies and industries are going to be impacted by this new regulations. And we are spending a lot of time on that, trying to figure out which of our companies are the most acceptable. And we've been trying to game that out over the last year, you know, trying to think what are the odds of who's going to win and what will happen. And it's, had, it's an impact on the margin, some of our decisions, because we think it's going to be such a dramatic difference in this administration from the past administration. Um, and we think the tax um, heights will, will not be that significant, will be offset by the major infrastructure 
dollars that will be spent. It will help goose the economy. So we've been trying to invest more on the margin, more cyclical types of companies and companies that will benefit from this uh, uh, reimagining of America and all the new construction that will happen in, in the future. So you know, kind of that's that. Um, the final thing I would say, the idea of staying in touch with us, you know, we have again Leah on the on the call, who's you know, loves being a graduate of the Yale, Yale and Yale Graduate School, but um, she could help connect anyone to the Aerial Community Academy and the work that we've done uh, there. And um, we have a full time person here at the firm who works with the school. And as I said already, the school's twenty five years old, and we love the program that's there. And then we also, as I mentioned earlier, our Charlie Robinsko, our vice chairman, has a different program that he's helped to energize around primarily Catholic schools. So we've been able to touch both Catholic and public schools. And we would love to share all of our ideas, our information, what we've learned, our mistakes we've made, successes we've had, uh, struggles that we've had. But we really do believe that it is the heart of what we can do to help get kids more financially literate, literate and prepared for financial services careers. And the final thing Dean Charles mentioned earlier, we created a program at the University of Chicago that we think can be a model for other universities where minority students get paid internships to work in the investment offices of major endowments under our Rogers Scholars Program. And we think that would be a great thing for your institution too and others to be able to get uh, kids uh, from disadvantaged backgrounds to have a chance to work in the endowment offices and learn from the David Swinsons and the leaders like that and those types of careers can be really special because you're helping your alma mater to be stronger and at the same time you know learning about all the different aspects of the economic and investment ecosystem so we have no better place to learn than being involved in a, in a major endowment i uh i i i'm 100 behind you on that uh david has trained so many successful uh graduates of his um of his shop over the years and uh and uh you know there's nothing like learning learning by doing with somebody that 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 is uh, really good at it and you know the university endowments have this um this orientation towards long-term investing uh that uh, allows them to, to 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 place those kinds of bets as opposed to short term so uh yeah makes sense but I would just say one last quick thing is that I challenge, I'm challenging all universities and nonprofits, museums, hospitals too, to follow the University of Chicago's model and work with minority firms with the decisions they make in their endowments, challenge the outside firms who manage the money to have diverse teams on the relationship with the institution, and then have more diverse executives within the endowment offices throughout the United States. And uh, we think there's probably less than 10 in the history of the country that have had an African-American manage a major endowment in the United States history. So it's a field that we've been left out of. And I think dynamic leaders can really make a difference in the nonprofit world by thinking about diversity in everything they do, uh, the way maybe governments do and some corporations do. John, we're out of time uh, and it, time went quickly. I tell you, it's great to get your thoughts and, 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 your, and your, the, the uh, deep connections you have both to history and to the, the uh, financial industry and, and uh, to uh, some of the missions that you've talked about. So uh, we wanna thank you uh, very much for uh, giving your time today and really appreciate um, this visit. Well, thanks so much. It's terrific to be here.